Welcome on into a special Ravelry Edition crossover podcast. Mitch Harper, Utes Insider Steve Bartle. I host Cougar Tracks and Steve, you Utah host Blockcast, baby. That's right. All on KSLSports.com and the KSL Sports app. Rivalry Week is here. It's been a long time since BYU traveled to Salt Lake City to take on the Utah Utes. We navigated a once in a lifetime pandemic in between the times that these teams last met at Rice Eccles, but now it's back and now it's got a Big 12 conference stage. Pretty interesting dynamic, right? With that whole conference affiliation now and being in the same conference as this being a conference game just takes on a totally different vibe and feel with this one the intensity is is as strong as it's ever been uh it's uh and we've there's certainly things contributing to the to that intense feel and uh it's going to be a fun one this weekend we're going to break down the matchup here in the podcast probably share some memories too Break down the the fan dynamics maybe a little bit here in this podcast. Subscribe to the Utah Block Podcast and Cougar Tracks. Again, wherever you get your podcast, leave that five-star rating and a review. Follow Steve on X, Bartle KSL Sports. Follow myself, Mitch underscore Harper. And, and of course, subscribe to all of KSL Sports social media out, out platforms. We're everywhere. Uh, X, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. So follow us there at KSL Sports. But this is a big meeting again. First time since 2021 that these two teams have met. And, you know, I, I look at this game, Steve, and I feel like there's been a push from school presidents to say rival right. We're seeing the I-15 billboards. We're seeing the messaging. President Taylor Randall, President Shane Reese, and Utah running back Jalen Glover, he had – Different plans, which, you know what, I liked it, though. I liked the – because it added to rivalry lore, in my opinion. Yeah, listen, we don't need to to say what Jalen Glover said, you know, but uh, we know what it is, you know. Yes. And it's it's certainly an interesting dynamic, right, given the fact that the, the two university presidents have shared the message of, you know, being civil, being respectful. And I think there is a place for that. There's plenty of room for that. But, man, I love it. <laughs> I love yeah. when you get these sort of moments because that is what makes college football, college sports in general, so special is you get that genuine emotion um, that just contributes to the intensity, um, you know, both on and off the field for the players, for the fans. You know that this game, it, you're going to get each other's best shot. And I think as fans, like, that's exciting. We want that. We want to see these great games and, you know, a comment like the one Jalen made certainly adds a little fuel to the fire for that. <laughs> I do like his Cold War. I like that name. I'm on board with too. the Cold War. We don't really mention the other <laughs> one per se. We don't. It's it's funny. The, the national media and everyone else really outside local media bring it up uh, as the as the other term. Cold War, though, I'm on board with. I can I can get down with Cold War. You know, there's certainly some parallels. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you know? I will say though, if a BYU player said that, I think you would have had a little more outrage. You think so? I do. Ooh, think I don't so. know because, as we know, Steve, you know when BYU guys do something, it has a little bit of that. Well, now are they going to go check in with their bishop? Are they, are they going to go? <laughs> are they going to be suspended potentially? Remember Spencer Hadley in 2013. He had a Vegas party with, you know, the glitzy club tau, and he's got his name spelled out in Spencer, and he was suspended. And then a Sports Illustrated feature writer writes a big piece of Road to Redemption. I'm like, dude, he just had an awesome party. He had the dream. He had beautiful ladies. He had a great time, and he's suspended. And we're saying Road to Redemption? I need a Road to Redemption. <laughs> Oh, man, I totally forgot about that. Um, yeah, that's incredible. You know, it's interesting, right? So you see the national reaction to to Jalen Glover's comment, right? I think Alex Kersher of the, uh, oh, what's the podcast name there? The Split Zone Duo. Split Zone Duo, that's right. You know, he summed it up perfectly. He's like, oh, man, uh, an apology issued by Jalen Glover. What's this going to be? And then you realize it was just you know, a little, a little <laughs> curse word, right? And it's just like, oh my gosh, this is where we're at with this rivalry. Is little things like that, and it, it takes all it takes is something like that, and you just you get the regurg regurgitation <laughs> of everything on both sides of the rivalry, and it's uh, it's fun to relive it. It's maddening. It's frustrating at the same time, and but like that again. That is what makes this rivalry so special. Is that there's moments, there's quotes, all yep. of it. 
uh, on both sides. I, I think back to Austin Colley when he said magic happens. Uh, Brady Papinga had some great quotes, even when BYU was losing. I think he said something about paraphrasing that we're closer to nine wins, or I, I can't remember. And then there's always been just good good moments. Eric Weddle, he's like, we are honored to play against them in 2006. <laughs> there's been great moments. And I'm curious, Steve, as Utah has settled into life now in the Big 12 Conference, do you feel like the the dynamics of this rivalry are gonna are gonna be different now that's back in a league, or do you think it's gonna kind of revert back to what it once was, or does it take on a different look in your opinion? No, it's absolutely going to take on a different feel. We're already experiencing that that change, right? Is that it is just so much more a part of our experiences now, right? Because it it genuinely impacts each other's seasons. It's not just like, because, I mean, you go back a couple of years, right? Utah loses to BYU in 2021. What did they do that season? They win the Pac-12 championship. Yep. They go to the Rose yep. Bowl. It's a great year for everybody. But this, with it being a conference game, it just takes on a totally, it takes on greater importance. And it's, there's more pain for the loser, probably. There's going to be more joy uh, for the winner. And it just takes on a a completely different feel with this being, you know, a Big 12 conference game. And, you know, you look back at the history, 88 years of being in the same conference for this uh, for these two programs. Um, and you, you understand why there was so much frustration, disdain for Utah, getting that invitation sure. uh, into the Pac-12 and, and BYU electing to go independent because these two schools have been you know, linked together for so long. And I think it just takes on a, a, you know, there's just so much more meaning to the game, to the rivalry. uh, And, and you're seeing that. I do believe that even though these two programs, you know, they, you know, they're competitive, they want to beat each other, but when they're together in a league, you can build something pretty great with these two programs in one league. We saw that with the whack as it evolved and then in the Mountain West, it really took off. The Mountain West became a really good league that at the time when it was a, you know, a BCS world that we operated in, it was like the Mountain West is better than the Big East, which was an automatic AQ. And it was BYU, it was Utah, it was TCU. Utah had BCS bowls. TCU went to the Rose Bowl. BYU had double digit win season. So, you know, what's so fascinating about this Big 12 conference and there's still a filling out process for everyone, including BYU and Utah. This 16-team league still lacks a little bit of an identity. And I think that BYU and Utah can be at the foundation of whatever that identity becomes. And to me, it's the Big 12 is always going to be this competitive, no-floor league where anyone can get you on any given Saturday. And hopefully, we see these teams and programs become at the top consistently, both of them, in the years to come. BYU, of course, right now, 8-0. Utah at four and four. How have we got to this point, Steve, where Utah is the team fighting for its bowl eligibility? What, what's been transpiring from your vantage point, being everywhere, covering this team inside and out? Why are the Utes at four and four coming in? Yeah, this you game? know, Mitch, it's it's certainly interesting this season when you look back at it. Um, you know, obviously last night with the college football playoff ranking, BYU coming in nine, I think is you know a little disrespectful, and I but I think it speaks to the, the Big Twelve, and I'm I'm getting to the point here is that. You know, in in the Big 12, I think there's a great opportunity for Utah and BYU to emerge as, you know, top contenders. BYU has obviously done that this season. They've taken care of business. And, you know, Utah is amongst a group that have failed to live up to those preseason expectations. And it hurts. The, it's hurt the, the conference's perception, right? Utah, obviously, four and four to this point of the year. And, you know, you can you can sum it up. It, it, in, in essentially with what happened to Cam Rising, when you talk about it in a vacuum, um, it just the impact that his injuries have had on this team. Um, you know, obviously there are, are greater issues at hand, but when you talk about what's impacted Utah the most this season, in, in the season, it's without a doubt that Cam Rising injury first the the finger injury against Baylor with the water cooler and then again against Arizona three plays into that game gets rolled up on um and and is done for the season that has had just um a 
a painful effect on this team. And I think, you know, what, what we've learned is like, there are flaws. Every team has flaws, right? Quarterbacks are like great pitchers. When you have a great one, he can cover up for a lot of issues. Uh, And without that, those issues, they, they, they've always been there. They're just not being covered up by, by that great pitcher anymore. And I think that's what we've learned this season is that, you know, there, there are issues. And when you don't have that quarterback that can overcome and, uh, you know, navigate some of those issues, this is, this is what happens is you, you have an offense that, you know, it, it fails to produce. It becomes more and more difficult to find ways to produce. And here we are now, Utah's, you know, on a four game losing streak and it's tough. They're searching for answers, and obviously that all revolves around that quarterback position. BYU is 8-0, number 13, or n- number 13 preseason Big 12 poll coming into the year. And I'll be honest, like everyone else, I had low expectations for this team. I thought I was maybe on an island saying they were going to go to yeah. a bowl game by picking them to go 6-6. Six and six. I thought that was a bit extreme. It, you know, I thought I was at, again on on an island on my take, but uh, they have exceeded everyone's expectations. Eight and zero, and this team's been you know playing at a pretty high level. I've, I've been impressed with how, and I think Kyle Whittingham even said this this week that it's just a complimentary effort. And yeah. I think you know some Cougar fans maybe took it as a slight on BYU's personnel when Whittingham said it's not one guy that stands out. He's right, though, because, you know, even J.J. and Alex on our sibling station, uh, the KSL Sports Zone, they asked me, you know, who's the MVP of BYU? And I kind of thought about him like, I don't know. I, I, I'll i probably default to Jake Retzloff because I feel like you got to have legit quarterback play. And to your point about Cam Rising, I mean, that was that was a big, you know, uh, what hurt Utah a little bit this year. Listen, when when Kyle Whittingham talks about balance, that is the ultimate compliment from him because – he loves balanced teams, teams that can beat you, whether if you try to take away the run, you can beat them with the throw game. You try to load up against the throw game, you yeah. can beat them. With, you know, th- that is a tremendous compliment from Kyle Whittingham because he's, that's his biggest goal is complete balance on both sides of the ball. And, and you know, that's what you see with this BYU program is they just, there's a lot of balance on both sides of the ball. They are. And, you know, I've been, I've been impressed with, BYU's defense and, and Jay Hill, you talk about BYU Utah rivalry and the crossovers between these staffs. There's so much crossover. I mean, Whittingham was once a BYU player. Jay Hill was once a Utah player, and he's wearing the blue for the first time in this rivalry. Uh, that defense, though, has been night and day different this season. They've got more speed than I think people give them credit for, particularly at the linebacker position. But, uh, you know, going back to Jake Retzloff, he has been uh, very impressive. I thought after week two, the way that they beat SMU 18 to 15, I thought, man, he's got to turn it up because he struggled mightily in that game. And you thought, oh, is Gary Bohannon going to be nipping at his heels? But uh, he's just gotten better each and every week. And BYU has remained undefeated. And, you know, it goes into this game where, uh, you know, do we do you do sub- subscribe to the thought, Steve, that throw the records out and, and that doesn't matter here? Or do you feel like what we've seen to this point from Utah is going to carry over to this game or is this going to be a completely different look Utah team coming out of the bye week? Yeah, you know, you don't, you can't completely throw away everything. But again, based on you know, what we were talking about earlier with the rivalry is that, you know, when you get in a rivalry game like this, you're going to get the best from each program, right? And so, you know, Utah isn't what we expected them to be and in many regards this season, especially offensively. But you know that they are going to do all that they can to give BYU that that their best punch, and that's that's always going to be a thing in this program. You know, you made the the point. I think the last time we spoke, last time we did a podcast, that when we talked about this game, is this has had a number of one score games. You know, even throughout the nine game winning streak for Utah, seven of those games were still one scores. And, you know, you think of the difference in talent on paper between the two programs during that time. And, you you know, for those for the majority of those games to come down to one score, I think it just speaks to that rivalry dynamic. Now, again, with what we're seeing this season, Utah is is not what we expected them to be. And, you know, on the other end of that, the flip end of that is BYU is just playing 
great football and they're playing with a lot of confidence and that can do a lot for a program, you know, especially this late in the season, going through the grind, playing with confidence can be a huge difference maker. So you can't completely just disregard what we've seen from both programs but you know that you're going to get the best from each one. I, I do agree. I, I think that I think back to the last visit to Salt Lake, Utah already wrapped up the Pac-12 South. They were a sizable favorite. I think it was 11 point favorite, and BYU shockingly pulled off. Uh, they were up 20 to zero, yeah. and then then there was a pick six, and then they answered back, and they were up 27 to seven. And then I think Jason, going into the, I think there was 45 seconds left, 27 to seven. Yep. And yeah, and Jason there, Shelley turned it on, turned it up. Yeah. What. Where does that one stack up? And as we kind of look at some of the rivalry memories over the years, what are some of your uh, memories of this rivalry that really stand out to you when you think about it, particularly on the Utah side? That that game is certainly one that stands out. Uh, I was on the sideline for that game, and being there, you know, on the field and the emotion, the the noise, the just the the volume in that stadium, especially during that fourth quarter, it was incredible. The twenty twenty one game, similarly for you know, on the other end of that, incredibly loud environment. Probably maybe the loudest environment outside of, you know, Rice Eccles and and, you know, some of those moments that, that we've experienced there. But just an incredible environment and, you know, that was obviously a, a tough loss for Utah. But going back, Brandon Burton's block field goal. Yeah. I remember I had just gotten home from my mission. Me and all my buddies got home from our missions all around the same time. Jeff Hansen, mm-hmm. you know, contributor here at KSL Sports with his high school coverage. Obviously, does a great job covering BYU as well. Uh, you know, he was high school buddy of mine. I was with a couple of our buddies and. You know, it all seemed to point to BYU coming away with the victory. Then Brandon Burton blocks the field goal. I'm the only Utah fan (laughs) in, you know, there in the house watching. And I just took a victory (laughs) lap around the house. And, you know, uh, it was that was so that was another great moment. Then obviously, you know, the ones before that, the 2004 game, um, you know, to to clinch that uh, opportunity to go to the Fiesta Bowl. Just a, a magical run. The game, the year before that, three zero game. I remember watching that, and just being like, "Holy cow!" Always, yeah. just on the edge of your seat, just wondering, like, is something going to break? Because, you know, it was it was just that tight. So obviously, those are are great memories for me and um and, and all that. But I, I'd be curious to hear what are some the uh, of yours, Mitch. Well, when you bring up the 2010 game, I think BYU was up 16-0, and then Robert and I took his foot off the gas with the freshman Jay Keeps, and Utah just. Gained steamed and, and gained steam and and got that seventeen to sixteen victory over BYU. You know, uh, some of my first memories of BYU and Utah really are are kind of like lifestyle wise. Where I my my family uh, growing up, so my dad grew up he's a BYU guy, my uncle a Utah fan, and those two would have just conversations even in. You know, like it's a whack tournament basketball game in March and they're arguing, they're back and forth. And I'm a young child just seeing these arguments. I'm thinking this BYU Utah thing, man, it is intense. And, you know, just seeing the interactions, the how fired up it it gets people. And like I've experienced that firsthand. And then you factor in the games. And I remember. You know, the 1996 game, BYU, it was a 10 a.m. game, and BYU, had there was Brad Nessler on the call, Gary Danielson, and BYU wins that one. I remember Chris Fuamatu Maafala for Utah, and it's like his brother was in the end zone, just T-shirt and shorts with like little tiny gloves in the end zone cheering on Utah. Uh, I remember that one. 1998, Ryan Kanashiro off the upright. And then, of course, 2006, you know, Beck to Harleen stands out. I mean, that was one where... BYU, it, it created a, a string of like ringtones. Remember ringtones? Like those were a thing <laughs> where you download the MP3 and it's you got the ringtone. Go to the ocean! Go to the ocean! Ah! You know, that became everyone's ringtone among BYU fans. My Motorola Razor, I had that. But, you know, just things like that because it just becomes part of your soul. It, like BYU in yeah. Utah is got so much intensity and it's awesome. I, I do believe though that Kalani and Wit, uh, have, since these two have been together though, it has kind of you know 
tapered off as far as the the sideshow things because Whittingham and, and Bronco did not like each other. No. I mean that that was pretty evident, and then it kind of caused this extra level of intensity and, and sideshow antics. Whereas I feel Kalani and Wit, even Utah fans respect Kalani. BYU fans, it's a mixed bag with Wit, but I think over time they can appreciate. That guy has become a really dang good coach. He's one of the best in college football, and I think there's some appreciation for that too. So I think that that dynamic has been good for this rivalry because it did get a little bit too heated between Bronco and Witt. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I, I'm I'm with you there. Uh, you know, you 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 hate how much social media has become just a part of our lives. Yes, but I remember those years. Yes, they were pretty tough, pretty toxic. They you know, were. You're talking Utah BYU. You know those early 2010s. To, to 2015, whatever it was. And it's daily, too. Yeah, that, that's what nonstop. Be, and, and, and that's why I try to explain to people in the Big 12, is like, this thing is daily, where... In every inch crevice of your life, oh, yeah. and, and, and it also, all matters. And us in our roles, when we say something that maybe is a, a take against the opposing team, like, oh, Steve was saying <laughs> that about BYU, total BYU hater. Oh, Mitch is just zoom goggling it up. Can't get enough of those zoobs down there in Provo. Like, like, but it's fun though. Like, we we love it. Like, don't make it personal, but I can take that. Like, I enjoy it. But like, it is every day. And and I just think that what's so fun about BYU and Utah, look, I've never lived Auburn and Bam. I've never lived, lived Michigan, Ohio State. But this is where you're you got private versus public. You've got re- a religion in the mix. You've got all these dynamics. And and I just feel like it's been a, a – this state has always felt like with its sports teams that they're overlooked way too much. Agreed. And, and that this rivalry is so good. When people experience it, they realize, man, that thing always lives up to the hype, the one-possession games. I mean, it's just so good. And the storytelling, the, 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 the pieces, the figures in this rivalry have always been just so good. I, I, I love the game. I, I didn't like it as much when it was a non-conference game. I understood it from both sides where it's like – you know what? I I don't. I'm okay to not play. I was a, kind of that right. guy. Yeah. But now that it's in a league, I'm all in. I'm on board, and I, I'm I'm pumped for this game. I share the same sentiment, Mitch, I, because you know it, it didn't have the same feel. It didn't have the yeah. same meaning, the same value to it. And now again, that it's a conference game, there's just so much more impact, so much more to it. And you know, it's it's uh, certainly a, <laughs> been an adjustment. I think for for everybody here is is embracing it as a conference game again because yep. it's just been so long since it's been uh, you know it's had this much meaning. But this is really uh, you know if you're Utah, you're looking at this as an opportunity to uh, you know play spoiler, at which you couldn't before you know in this rivalry is, is game. That there enough? wasn't that same impact. Is that enough for for Utah fans feel feel good about this season? Because I feel like. That's a that's a Utah fan feeling of like the '80s and '90s, where it's like let's spoil Utah BYU season. That's not is that enough to save this Utah season to say like just we beat BYU because I still feel it, like there's going to be a feeling of this was a missed opportunity. Here. It doesn't salvage. It doesn't save the season because expectations were much much bigger, right? But it it, it gives them something, yep. and I think that's what Utah fans are desperate for at this point. It's just give us something because it, there's so much more to it than just this season for Utah fans. It's all of last year as well. All of the frustration that's been felt this year, it's been prolonged over the last 24 months for Utah fans. And it just feels like everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. And so for this game, again, it's not going to wipe away all of that frustration for Utah fans, but it is going to give them something to build on, to move forward with. And I think that, that is, I don't know that it's enough for yeah. Utah fans, but but you know I think it it certainly helps to to turn things around for Utah. Late night kick eight fifteen. Steve and I will both be inside Rice Eccle Stadium covering the game for KSLSports.com and our respective beats will be televised on ESPN. We'll have tons of coverage on KSLSports.com. Who are the maybe the matchups you're looking for on the Utah side that you feel will be key? To a victory for the Utes. Yeah, you know, this this game is, I think this is going to come down to, you know, the trenches, right? When yep. you look at this Utah team, everything revolves around the run game on both sides of the ball. And when Utah's, you know, when they have were getting wins, when they were producing on offense, you know, it's because they had Makai Bernard you know, producing at a at a pretty good level. Obviously, the passing game has uh, has got to open some things up, 
but you look at this matchup with BYU and uh, the way that they play defense, like to keep guys in 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 coverage, like to to take away those big plays, and that's a great way to play in today's games. You know, particularly with as things have trended to the throw game and and you know becoming more explosive. I think BYU's defense it's it's brilliant, it's great um, because it forces teams to execute at a high level for a greater amount of plays. And I think that's, it's going to be tough. So Utah, they're going to need to be really, really tough, really, really physical. You know, you saw, you've, you've seen some, some signs, some indications from, uh, from, you know, previous BYU games that, you know, perhaps give you hope that this run game can get going right. Going back to that Oklahoma state game with Ollie Gordon getting going, you know, you can look at that game for Utah and, and feel um, like you've got an opportunity there to generate some some production in the run game, but it's going to come down to you know the offensive line. The little details with the offensive line uh, are going to be exponentially more important because again, this BYU defense just makes you work for everything, uh, and and so it's going to require a lot of the of the offensive line. I'm glad you bring up the trenches because during the nine game win streak that Utah had from 2010 to 2020. Utah had a sizable edge personnel wise, depth wise in the trenches and BYU has made a ton of effort to improve in that area. Kalani prioritized that. I mean, Kalani learned under Whittingham and how to build a team. And that's the focus. I'm glad you bring that up because I'm with you. I feel like BYU's offensive line against Utah's defensive line is going to be a huge area of focus because I mean, I've witnessed many BYU games, Steve, and you have too, BYU and Utah, where BYU rolls into Salt Lake and they can't generate a run game. I mean, outside of, you know, even odd odd to say, but 2008, where BYU got blown out, Max Hall threw five picks, Harvey Unga had a little bit of success on the ground. He had quite a bit of success, but the turnovers for BYU were costly. But more times than not, BYU can't run on Utah, particularly in Salt Lake. That's going to be a huge area of focus. Utah, defensive line personnel-wise, Tafuna, O'Toole, they're going to all be good. Trending positively on that front for Utah's defensive line, I think we'll see for the first time this season a defensive line as healthy as it's been since game one. So, you know, you're talking about Junior Tafuna, Keanu Tanavasa, Aliki Vamahi, yep. who has been out since that SUU game. I think they get all those guys back. Connor O'Toole made his return against Houston. I think he's continued to to get healthier. He'll play a bigger role in this one. And Kareni Reed, too, who's been back for a couple of games now, having that bye week to give him a little bit more rest, I think has been uh, has been really good for him. And I think Utah's defensive front is as healthy as it's been all season. BYU going to be without Connor Pay. He's doubtful. Bruce Mitchell, the center for the Cougars. But I think they've had a lot of success running the football with LJ Martin. He had a little bit of a bruised knee coming out of the UCF game. 100% according to Kalani Satake. He practiced all of last week. So he's going to be a big focal point. BYU... In games on the road, they have made him a priority early in the game. I expect more of that. And if he can have success early, I think that's going to bode well for BYU because you cannot be a one-dimensional team against Utah on the road. I, I still think you know, Utah's number two in the Big 12 in conference play in total defense. There's still a very, very good defense. BYU fifth in conference play in defensive metrics. So BYU's got to be able to establish the run. I, th- I think that's going to be the biggest key because – when BYU becomes one-dimensional, that's where things can get a little dicey, I think, for for Jake Retzlaff, where he gets a little too aggressive and he keeps you on the edge of his seat, or on the edge of your seat with his throws. So that's going to be a key for me. And I think also, too, it's easy to say, but the, the turnover margin. I mean, there's been oh, so yeah. many you know turnovers uh, where BYU particularly, I mean, I, I think of many... Utah games were pick sixes. And has Utah had a pick six this year and extended the streak that they I, had? No, I, they haven't. They had the uh, the block kick six. That's what against Baylor, right? Against Baylor, but not a pick six this season. And that's that's a what? They've had that for two decades, that yeah, streak. Yeah, it's, I think, 19 seasons. Yeah, so that's, that's an area that I'm always kind of focusing on, too, when it comes to BYU-Utah, because I think... 2016, Kalani's first meeting. I think it was the first play of the game. Taysom Hill throws a pick uh, to Utah. It was a pick six. 2018, as we noted. So that's going to be an area of focus. Uh, 
Yeah, it, plus seven for BYU this year in the yes. turnover margin in Utah. I believe they are minus four this year in the turnover well, margin. So big difference there. Well, and just kind of talking about like interceptions, you know, the quarterback situation for Utah, Isaac Wilson, Brandon Rose, much debate about who's it going to be. I mean, the interceptions have been an issue for Isaac, and and he's still learning. I, I still believe that Isaac's going to be really good. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I think his talent is is off the charts. I mean, watching him at Corner Canyon, I've always said – He's much farther ahead than where Zach was as far as coming out of high school. Uh, and, and Zach turned out to be a special football player at BYU. Yep. What's your expectations or just maybe your your sense of the quarterback situation for Utah heading into this matchup? Yeah, obviously it was interesting to hear Kyle Whittingham talk about have how they have a plan. You know, they spent last yep. week evaluating the position with Brandon Rose and with Isaac Wilson. And, you know, for Isaac, this has been a difficult year. This has been a situation that he's been thrust into that – this was not the plan at all, yeah. right? Like the the coaches and Kyle Whittingham basically spelled it out for us that they were planning on Cam being healthy and Isaac getting playing time sporadically throughout the season. You know, coming in as a true freshman, it's rare to see a true freshman find success over the course of the season in college football because it's just a totally different game. Uh, you know, there's so many more coverages that you got to be mindful of, so many more adjustments you've got to be aware of. And for Isaac, you know, that's been a little bit of an, of of the the learning curve has caught up to him. And you know, defenses are you know opposing defenses are not going to go easy on a true freshman. They're going to turn it up. They're going to yeah. crank it up. And so, you know, for Isaac, it's it's been difficult. It's been a difficult year. And I do think, you know, with some of the bumps and bruises, uh, they've, as a true freshman too, you're not where you need to be physically either. And I think that's contributed to some issues, you know, over stretches of, of a game. And I think for him, you know, an opportunity uh, to, um, you know, kind of reset this past week, uh, is probably a good thing for him. But with this opportunity, I also think Brandon Rose is going to be some somebody to just, you know, I think we'll we'll see him this Saturday for Utah. I think he's going to be the guy. And with Brandon, you, know, you talk about another kid that has a big arm. Uh, he comes from, uh, he came from a high school program in California uh, where he produced big numbers. It's a, a D1 producer um, and you know, for him, it's it's going to be interesting. So what sort of adjustments do we see? I don't know with Mike Bajakian and yeah. what sort of, you know, uh, fingerprints he wants to have on the offense. We'll learn that this week, obviously. Uh, but I think that's kind of what we'll see is Brandon Rose as the quarterback for Utah. And what what does that do for Utah? You know, we'll see. Yeah, BYU's defense is, is definitely going to turn up the heat with Jay Hill and, and Tyler Batty, Jack Kelly, uh, they will pride, try to pressure him early and yep. get home. And, and they'll be interested to see if they can get that done uh, because BYU has always just had an answer, uh, their defense. They'll give up some yards, as you noted earlier about Ollie Gordon. And there's been first quarters in games, Arizona, uh, Kansas State, where they won 38-9. to But early on, they, they kind of allow some yards. I'm curious to see if Utah's offense – can have success early, but I think I think BYU's defense has been very good this year, and and I think this could be a game, Steve, where first one to maybe twenty one yeah. could win. I mean, and I say that because Utah hasn't hit the, hit the twenty point mark since Oklahoma State yep. in September, so this could be a rock fight. No, it I I I expect it to be a rock fight. Uh, you know, again, just continuing the theme. All show long, you're going to get each each program's yeah. best best shot, right? And I think defensively, this Utah team has continued to show that fight and effort in each of these games. They haven't done enough to to limit enough points off of the board, uh, but they've continued to battle, continue to fight. I think you'll see that from this defense uh, again on Saturday. For the offense, I think it's super important that they start – that they get a first quarter quarter score uh, against BYU. That was an issue. When you go back to the last home game against TCU, they just didn't get the crowd into the game, hmm. right? They had drives that stalled out early on in the red zone. They didn't get points. They didn't punch it into the end zone. And that sort of just kind of deflated the, the vibe, the atmosphere. And I think it's so important for Utah to get – uh, a first quarter score to start stronger than they have to get the crowd go into the game and to give them, you know, 
reasons to hope, to believe. And I think that'll that'll be big. That's a big key for me is getting a first quarter score and then just continue to fight and scrap. Starting away. starting strong has has been a big thing for BYU th- this season. So I think that that's a good point about setting the tone early could be huge in this game. Final score predictions. I'll, I'll go first, Steve. I I do think BYU is going to win this one. I, I think BYU gets it done. I think they get to twenty four. I, I I'll say Utah. I'll say Utah 17. I think it's going to be a one possession game. I think BYU finds a way to, you know, maybe tack on a touchdown early in the fourth quarter and maybe holds on to that, that seven point lead. But I think BYU gets it done. What's your score prediction? Yeah, obviously, logically, you look at the numbers, you look at the two teams, BYU coming into this one undefeated, playing great football, Utah not playing good football at all on a four game losing streak. But I just think, you know, this team is going to break through this week. Uh, I'm not pre- predicting that the offense is going to come to life and they're going to yeah. produce. This is going to be a grind. This is going to be just a white knuckle grip type of game where you're holding on to the edge of your seat, uh, waiting for something to happen. I think it's going to be you know, a struggle, a grind, but I think Utah can get to 17, 20 points, uh, and it's going to be close. It's going to come down to the wire, uh, and I think – I'm going to pick Utah 20 and I'll I'll say BYU 17. There have been many games in this in this rivalry with that kind of score. I think yeah. uh 2001, uh 2002 it was 13 to 6. I think t- 2001 was 21 to 10, I believe, or 21 14, something like that. I mean, so it, it might seem low, but the history of this rivalry tends to suggest like it's a little bit lower than usual. I mean, even 2021, it was 26 17 yeah. in that game. So uh, that's kind of what you expect with BYU and Utah. Again, we're going to have a ton of coverage. I, I can't wait to, to cover the game uh, with you, Steve, inside Rice Eccles Stadium. I haven't covered a game uh, at Rice Eccles uh, here since I've been at KSL. It's kind of crazy to think that we've experienced a conference change. Like I said earlier, a pandemic. Uh, we've had two presidential elections, but haven't covered BYU Utah Crazy. in Rice Eccles. So can't wait. Uh, I'm looking forward to all the coverage. I'm sure we'll have some crossover content coming up on Saturday night and should be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's going to be a great game. I think it'll be, uh, you know, you're going to see the South End Zone for the first time in a game, right? Yes. That's that's another thing here is the South End Zone. And, and you know, I'll, I'll be uh, interested to hear what you think of that and the impact that it has on the atmosphere compared to what you know it as, you know, previously. Yep. Uh, I do think it's up the ante a little bit in terms of the atmosphere with that South End Zone closed off. Uh, you know, but it's, this is, you know, this is a great rivalry. And I think it's, it's unfortunate that this is such a late kick. I was yes. hoping praying, whatever, you know, sending the vibes up that we got a primetime kick for this because this game deserves it. I think, you know, with where Utah is at, obviously you can place blame there for not holding up their end of the bargain here. BYU obviously did that at 8-0 and ranked number nine in the country. It's unfortunate, uh, but still I think it's a great opportunity. 815 kick ESPN. It's still going to get a lot of views. And I think this is this is going to be a game that I think lives up to the hype with it being the first Big 12 conference game. I'm excited to see what that looks like. He's Steve Bartle, host of the Utah Blockcast. I'm Mitch Harper, host of Cougar Track. Subscribe to both our podcasts. Even if you're a Ute fan, you can listen to, to my show once in a while. Maybe, maybe in BYU <laughs> fan, listen, cross enemy lines, support <laughs> Steve. It's fine. Or, you know, just stay on the stay on your side of the turf yeah, and just please. dip into this episode. At least That's this fine. week, please. Just this, this, this week. But <laughs> nonetheless, let's have a good time. Let's have a fun game. Let's have some great memories with this BYU-Utah rivalry. And we will talk to you next time here on Cougar Tracks and then, of course, on Utah Blockcast as well. It's all powered by kslsports.com.